yes. Good day, my friends. How are you today? A happy day in Mulda. Is it good? Yeah. yeah? Gold medals came yesterday. No, Saturday actually. After some ner nerve breaking uh, matches. Okay. Um, Maria, I think you kind of uh, asked last time about some uh, potential extended uh, exercises. I picked up some from the textbook here, so you can uh, find them all on uh, Fronte. Okay, so today we will... Uh, hello, I started a little bit early perhaps, sorry about that, but uh, I'm just... Uh, I'm just... Um, telling the students that there is some uh, more exercises in the textbook that you may have a look at if you want to uh, do more exercises uh, in preparation for the exam. Uh, the topic of today was uh, this exercise set 3, so let's have a look at that. <coughs> Yeah, this is uh, an exercise, it seems to be combined exercises from chapters 9 and 10. I think the first one is picked from chapter 9. Um, it says here, from time to time, Congress has raised the minimum wage. Some people suggested that a government subsidy could help employers finance the higher wage. Employers finance the higher wage. This exercise examines the economics of a minimum wage and wage subsidies. The first thing we need to note when we watch or look at this exercise is that now we suddenly change the market structure. Here. Okay, so we have normally been uh, discussing product markets, but this is a labor market. So uh, this is kind of the other way around, isn't it? Who are the suppliers in the labor market? That's the workers, okay? They sell their employment opportunities to the employer. So the ep employers, or what we normally would uh, figure to be suppliers, are demanders here, okay? So this is kind of reversed due to the fact that we look at a labor market. Apart from that, of course, there is really no change, but it can be quite... Uh, um confusing perhaps, but um, uh, this exercise is, is focused on the labor market. So here we have some information. Suppose the supply of low skilled labor is given by Ls equal to 10W, where Ls is the quantity of low skilled labor in millions of persons employed per year, and W is the wage rate in dollars per hour. And then the demand for labor of course, labor demanders are typically companies or businesses or whatever, uh, is given by uh, LD equal to 80 minus 10 W. And again, of course, the demand curve would be expected to have the kind of downward sloping fashion. If uh, price is low, you would expect many workers hired. Okay, if the labor force is cheap, you hire a lot. If it's expensive, the price goes up, then you hire less. So you have the same structure of the demand curve in this situation as in normal product markets. The supply curve is linear here, 10W, and it's proportional, so it kind of goes through Origo in a diagram. Uh, then question A, what will be the free market wage rate and employment level? That's the first question. And we solve that in a normal fashion, okay? We just, if we want to do it graphically, we make a graphical picture of the supply curve as well as the demand curve, and we find the intersection, and that intersection point will produce the answer for A, okay? It produces a price, in this case, W. Remember that, the price here is called W, it's the wage rate. And it produces, of course, also an amount of workers being kind of traded in this market or as it says here, number of persons employed each year. So that should be straightforward. So uh, to solve the first part of A here, if there is any white chalk, yes there is. So where is the camera? 
camera. There is the camera. Okay. Equilibrium. Wage. And persons employed. Can be straightforwardly found by taking LS and equate it to LD, which produces 10 W equal to 80 minus 10 W. And of course, we need to solve for W in this equation by moving this part on the left hand, for instance. Then it's 10 W already plus 10 W equal to 80. 10 plus 10 is 20 W equal to 80 and W and uh, we may put a star or something to mark that it's the solution here is 80 over 20 which should be 4 okay so the equilibrium wage in these markets is four dollars per hour the number of people people employed can then simply be found either by putting four into this one or into that one Okay, that will produce the, the equilibrium number of persons employed. So uh, L star, should we call it that? The number of people in the labor market being engaged here which would then be 10 times W star or 10 times 4, which is 40, or in the notation here 40 million persons so that is the solution to the first part of exercise a you can observe here that when you ask the question what will be the free market wage it means that we we, we assume that this labor market is a perfectly competitive market okay so the notion of a free market as well as a com perfectly competitive market as well as a competitive market all kind of means the same that we can kind of use this equilibrium model. Uh, we can graph these, of course. Uh, hopefully, this is done in the solution. Let's have a look. Yeah, you see the, the blue line here is the supply curve of labor, while the red curve is the demand curve for labor. And the intersecting point here is 4, as you can say, see down here, and 40. So uh, a graph produces the same solution, as we should expect. Then further on in question A, it says, suppose the government sets a minimum wage of $5 per hour. So that means that uh, they kind of want to increase the wage rate in this market, doesn't it? Because the equilibrium solution is 4. So they want to put it up by a dollar to produce more money for the employees. Of course, if this minimum wage had been three, it wouldn't have any effect, would it? Because the wage is already four, okay? So that wouldn't make any difference. So in the case you want to put in a minimum wage, you would kind of put it on top of the equilibrium wage system to, to make it binding or efficient, as we say. We can perhaps see this directly from the figure here. Here we are kind of put a green line at W equals 5, and then we, we get something here, doesn't we? It says here, if the government sets a minimum wage of dollar fund per hour, the demand for labor is 30. Okay. So as a consequence, only 30 million people are employed, employed compared to the 40 million in the equilibrium solution. But of course, these 30 million, they get a higher payment of $5 per hour instead of four dollars per hour. So that's the consequence here. The problem with the minimum wage is of course that you have to control it, don't you? Because if you kind of want to do something which is not the natural solution in the market, then you need to monitor and check whether it actually happens. And that has a tendency to cost a certain amount of money. Okay? Of course that money is not a part of this judgment. These monitoring costs will have to be taken into account if you really want to do something like this. So that should produce the answers for question A.
Okay, what about question B? Suppose that instead of a minimum wage, the government pays a subsidy of $1 per hour for each employee. So instead of producing a salary of $5, they uh, decide to pay each employee one dollar or if you like they, they kind of make it one dollar cheaper for the, the the suppliers here to know for the the monitors what will the total level of employment be now what will the equilibrium wage rate be okay so now we do something different we kind of try to regulate this market by adding a subsidy putting money into it instead of saying saying that you have to pay five dollars okay that's the the difference here. So let's uh, have a look at the solution here. Now it says you know remember that in a labor market model as this is things are in some sense turned around okay, as I started by here. The consumers are the firms demanding labor while the producers are the workers supplying their working hours. Hence when the subsidy is put into the economy it becomes one dollar cheaper per hour for the firms to buy labor. Okay. That can be transformed into a change in the demand curve by just subtracting the original W with 1. Okay. That's the way to interpret this. Then of course we get a new supply curve here. We have the we have the same no, we get sorry, uh, I'm mixing up. We get a new demand curve here, but we have the the same su su supply curve of 10W. And of course then we can straightforwardly find the new equilibrium. The key to solve this exercise is really not what happens after this line, but to be able to, to state this. Okay, that's the kind of key to make it work. To kind of a little bit more up, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Very nice that you uh, comment on this because uh, I should perhaps have antis anticipated this, but um, as I said, the, the key to kind of be able to solve this task is to kind of understand that you can transform the demand curve into this this expression. Okay, so it's kind of the meaning of this reduction of one dollar. <coughs> it it's in principle possible to interpret this as doing it on the other curve as well. That would produce a different result. But in any case, given that you're able to do this, then you you find uh, this equation 2 and you just equate equation 2 the, to the original 10W curve and then you solve again and it turns out that the wage rate now is reduced to 4.5 so that's straightforwardly the same procedure here just the equation and find this W star as 4.5 and then you just put it back into for instance the 10 times W curve to to find the effect on the number of em employees and that turns out in this case to be to be 10.4.5 times 4.5 which is 45 of course uh, you can watch this differently okay it says here in fact this corresponds to an upward shift in the demand curve as if you take this curve just compute it multiply 10 in here you get 80 minus 10 w plus 10 and then you can kind of take these 10 w and add it 10 sorry 10 and add it to 80 and then the resulting curve is 90 minus 10 w if you, if you recall <coughs> you have this original demand curve it en entered here at 80 didn't it that was the original one. <coughs> if you take away this minus one, it says put zero there, you get 80. You get a new one, which kind of has the same steepness due to this factor, which is unchanged. So it kind of moves up from 80 up to 90 here, and is a parallel to that one. So the actual meaning in this sense is a positive shift of the demand curve by putting subsidies into the economy. So you see we get kind of three different cases here. In the first case, we get a relatively low wage of $4, but a high amount of employees, which kind of seems reasonable. 
And the, the first change we do is to put this minimum wage in, then of course we get a higher wage of $5, but we get substantially less employees. So in the first case, we have a W04, this is the equilibrium case, and an amount of 40, wasn't it? And then we put in this minimum wage of 5, which produces a wage of 5, of course, but substantially reduces this amount to 30. The third case, with the subsidy, we move in between here to 4.5. So they get a little bit more, but of course it's kind of shared between the producers and the demanders here, if you like, the demanders and the suppliers. But we get 40, what did we get here? 45, didn't we? Yeah. So we get actually more, no, was it 40 here? Do I remember correctly? Yeah. yeah. So we get more people employed at a higher wage rate, actually, by using a subsidy. Of course, this kind of explains why politicians tend to prefer to use subsidies instead of putting these maximum or minimum wages in. The effect is, is, is kind of obvious in this example, where you, of course, you don't get exactly this amount, but if you put more subsidies into this, you could, of course, push the, push the wage up to five. Of course, but then it would be more expensive for the government. And we haven't looked at the expenditures here, have we? The difference in, in cost for, for, the, for, the, for the public sector. And of course, we, we don't get anything for nothing here, so this will be more expensive. But we get kind of a, a better effect. Okay. Questions? No questions? Okay. Then we move to the next exercise. It says the following. A monopolist firm, fa uh, a monopolist firm faces a demand with constant elasticity of minus 2.0. It has a constant marginal cost of $20 per unit and sets a price to maximize profit. If marginal cost should increase by 25%, would the price charge also rise by 25%? Okay, this is uh, perhaps a slightly tricky exercise, but and you need a special formula okay, to be able to solve it. That, that's the idea. Uh, the question for you should be, how could I be able to guess that what kind of formula I should use? And if you remember for this chapter, uh, this monopoly chapter, we looked at the special version of the monopolist pricing. There was a formula, wasn't it? There was something like what was it? Um, uh, yeah, I don't remember things, so let's look at the solution here. Okay. This formula, this five formula, was discussed in the lecture. Okay, it, it, it constructs a connection between marginal costs and elasticities, and that's the kind of information we have in these exercises, isn't it? There is a discussion on the value of the marginal cost as well as the elasticity. So when we have these marginal cost and these elasticity, then we can compute the price, which it corresponds to. And we can perhaps also look at the consequences of changing the price, which is the exercise text. It says here, here P0 is the original monopoly price. Okay? MC are the monopolist's marginal costs, and ED is the demand elasticity. Now, let us assume a certain percentual increase in marginal costs. In my solution here, I do this in general. Okay? I do not use the numbers in the text. You might as well do it in general, because then we know that it's, this is actually true for any price change. Of course, if we have a certain percentile increase in marginal cost, then that would mean that we would... Uh, from an original marginal cost, multiply this with one point something. If it's a 50% increase, it would be 1.50, wouldn't it? If it's a 25% increase, it would be 1.25. So if I take my original one and do something like this, where this alpha is a kind of percentual change measured in hundreds, okay? So I take the percentage and divide by 100 to get this way of calculating it. This is straightforward. If you had any knowledge of uh, 
discounting, for instance. Perhaps you don't, but um, in any case. Then, of course, we can look at what happens to the price if we introduce this new marginal cost, can't we? That's straightforward. <coughs> I just need some water on there. On this one. So let me try to recapture, okay? P0 equals MC divided by 1 plus 1 over ED. Okay, that is the formula which you kind of need to decide to use in this case. Okay, so we need to be slightly creative here or uh, try to understand that when we have these two given, then this is perhaps the sensible formula to start using. Okay, and then we say that. Um, the new price, given that the marginal costs are increasing by, this by a certain percent, would be mc times 1 plus alpha, where alpha is this percentual change measured in hundreds. But of course, the other parts here does not change, do they? This demand elasticity is related to the demand curve. Okay? It's calculated based on the demand curve. The marginal cost is the supply curve, so there's no connection between these two numbers. So if you change this one, you can still keep this at the same level. Okay? This is important to, to kind of recapture. Okay? For if you don't think like that, you may run into problems. In some situations, it could be measures which kind of change at the same time. But due to the fact that this is a kind of on, the, on the supply side, this is on the demand side, we can kind of change this one without needing to take into account that this one may change. And then, of course, we can write this as mc over 1 plus 1 over ed times 1 plus alpha, can't we? So what is this? This is our original p0, isn't it? So the new price can be written as p0 times 1 plus alpha, can't it? meaning that the new price behaves exactly as the change in the marginal cost. So if we introduce an increase in the marginal cost of 25%, we will see the same change of 25% in the price by this formula. No, this is not MC equals MR. This formula is a consequence Oh, MC equals MR. We, we discussed this last time, didn't we? Let's have a, a, a quick step back, okay? And look, uh, this was in uh, chapter 10, I think. If you don't understand this, go back and look at it once more, okay? But uh, I'll just point you to where we looked at this. How we actually arrived at this formula. And let's see here. We have to move a little. Here it is, okay? Arnar, we don't understand Icelandic. Don't you know that? Huh? You must start speaking English. <laughs> you tried to hide what you said from me. Okay, this is kind of what, uh, how we did this. We used the, that MR equals MC, as you can see here. This we need that one. That information is necessary to arrive at this formula here. Okay? So this was kind of a mathematical, what do you call it, derivation, to, to kind of write the information that marginal revenue equals marginal cost slightly different. And then we're able to kind of express how the monopoly price, the optimal price the monopolist will use, can be found if you have access to the marginal cost as well as the demand elasticity. And this exercise kind of gave that input. So you should kind of immediately think at this formula, given that you remember it, of course. So if you get the next sum where I put up this formula, then there are two possibilities. Either you need a formula or you don't. Okay, 
Yeah, it's up to you to decide whether you need it or not. Okay. So if I don't put it up, then it's a big chance that it's not necessary. Okay. Uh, I perhaps I don't expect you to keep remember these kind of formulas. Okay. Did I express myself clearly? Yes. Okay. So the point here is that we are kind of able to describe the new price by the old price. And then that's kind of what we try to do. In many cases, that could be sensible. Because this is a, a nice result, isn't it? Yes? I think I'm I have a little problem understanding your English. Can you try to rephrase you your question? Maybe you can. She wants me to do it in numbers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. I can do that very easily. I just uh, put it. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to make sure we yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah, yeah. Okay, what was the marginal cost here? 20, okay, so the original price is 20 divided by one plus one over minus two, isn't it? Ah, that can't be minus two here. We don't like that, it, we, we get rid of that. We, must, we can't have a negative price, can we? Maybe we can, yeah, we can, we allow that. So this is 20 over one minus a half is a half. Uh, so there's a half under here. That should be 40, shouldn't it? Did you get that? Price of 40, given this information. That's what happens here, okay, with these numbers. Now, we should increase the price by 25%. Okay, what is 25% of 20? That's 5, isn't it? Okay. So the new price should now be 25 divided by 1 minus or plus the same, okay? So again, of course, I get the number 2 here. I'm going to multiply that with... So then I get 25 divided by a half, which is 50, isn't it? So the price change here, the change in the price, is from 40 up to 50, a price change of 10. 10 out of 40 is 25 percent, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. This was better? Okay. I found the other one much better, much easier, much simpler. Of course, you can do this is kind of how you should do it, given the exercise in the textbook. Okay. I just skipped a little bit further to show that this is a general result. Okay. It uh, works no matter what percentage you, you put into it. just uh, need to do something with my fingers. Okay. Uh, this is a typical exercise which, which given that it's given to the exam, uh, will pr be produced maybe one or two students that are able to do it. Okay, so this is the types of exercises I normally do not give. It could be given as something late in an exercise, but it will kind of not define the total impression of the to total exercise, so to speak. Okay. Uh, we move on to uh, exercise four. A firm faces the following average revenue or demand curve. They tend to use this term average revenue. I don't know why, but I, I'm much more comfortable with uh, the demand as the concept. So it's given as P equal to 120 minus 0 0.02 Q. Where Q is weekly production and P is price measured in cents <coughs> per unit. The firm's cost function is given by C equal to 60 Q plus 25,000. Assume that the firm maximizes profit, profits 
what is the level of production price and total profit per week okay so this is a classical monopoly exercise we need to to um, to solve it unfortunately it doesn't say that there is a monopoly does it so there's a kind of error in the exercise basically it must there must be some notion that we are in a mon monopolistic market or something here which the exercise do not state on the other hand it's an exercise in chapter 10 which handles monopoly so it seems like a reasonable conclusion to to uh, to draw that this must be a monopoly market another argument is that the supply curve is not given here so we cannot kind of cannot we cannot actually solve or of course we can if we yeah no we can't we can't assume um a perfectly competitive market here in any case given that we accept that we can uh, find a solution <coughs> Now, there are two different ways of achieving the same in the monopoly, okay? Well, actually, there are three. Either we can use a graph, or we can use marginal cost to equal marginal revenue, or we can, can formulate, formulate the profits directly and solve for that. Uh, depending on what kind of information we have, each of these different ways of doing it should kind of be natural. In this case, there is, no, there is not a given marginal cost here. We have to take derivatives of the cost function to find that one. And the marginal re uh, revenue is not given either. So we might as well form the profits directly here, I think. Exercise four. <coughs> Profit should be a function of the quantity. And we find it by taking revenue as a function of quantity and subtract costs as a function of quantity. The cost function is given here, isn't it? It's 60Q plus 25,000. The revenue function is partly given by the fact that the demand curve is given. So we can form the revenue by taking P of Q times Q. And P of Q is 120 minus 0 0.02 Q and multiply that with Q. So this is the revenue part. Of course, we can multiply out here which if you like that, 120 Q minus 0.02q squared. So then it's just uh, putting this in for that, and that in for, the for that, and then take the derivative of the, the resulting expression, and equate it to zero, and solve for q, to find the quantity which is optimal for the monopolist. This one? Pi. Yeah, the, the whole this one? No. Yeah. The whole thing yeah. here? Yeah. This is the profit? Yeah. And it equals the revenue yeah. minus the costs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is R equals revenue and C equals costs. Total costs in this case. The cost function which is given in the exercise. And the profit are, as always, found by subtracting costs from revenue. That's kind of what you are left with. Okay. You earn something, you have to pay something to earn it. And the difference is what you're left with, or the profits. OK. So let's do that. Profit equals one twenty Q minus zero point zero two Q squared, which is the revenue part, and then we have to subtract this one. And of course then we have to subtract everything here. Meaning that this one will have to change when we take the parentheses away. Okay? So this is one twenty Q minus 0.02 Q squared minus 60 Q minus 25,000. And this one is the same as this one, so we can put them together. So 
So we have 120 minus 60 should be 60Q minus 0 0.02Q squared minus 25,000 as our final expression for the profit function in this case. Okay, that's kind of the basic building block. Then it's just a matter of calculations. I have to take the derivative of this one now. P prime OQ will be 60 in this case, minus 2 times 0 0.02 Q, and the derivative of 25,000 is 0. So we end up with the derivative of the profit as 60 minus 0 0.04 Q. That should be equated to zero to find a Q that optimizes the profit function and we get Q star equal to 60 over 0 0.04, don't we? Of course that will have to be evaluated either by a long division on a sheet of paper or using a calculator. So let's have a look at the solution here. You see I form the same here, here's the revenue part, here's the cost part, and I end up with the same expression here. And I should remember, Maria, to take it up a little bit higher, like this. Now you can see it as well. 60Q minus 0.02Q squared minus 25,000 is the same as this expression, isn't it? And then I take the first order derivative and I end up with 60 over 0 0.04. That produces 1,500 as the optimal quantity put into the market by the monopolist in this case. Of course, when we have a Q star, we're also asked in this exercise to find uh, the new level of production. This is this 1,500 number we found first. And then the price. What price does this correspond to? And then we have to remember that when we look at the monopoly, we have a demand curve, we have a marginal revenue curve, we have a marginal cost curve. What's the cost function look like here? It's linear, isn't it? So the marginal cost is constant here. 60 looks like this. This is the kind of pattern we see here. Here is the demand curve, here is the marginal revenue curve, and here is the marginal cost curve. It should equal 60 in this case. This is the cost function. The marginal cost is the derivative of the cost function, so that should be the derivative of this pattern, which is 60. This one is 0. <laughs> what we have found now is this point, isn't it? Now here is this 1500 point, which lies here. In order to find the price, you have to go up here into the demand curve, and read it up out here. Mathematically, that's just the same as putting 1500 into the demand curve and solve for that. <laughs> we have that POQ equals 120 minus 0.02Q, meaning that the optimal price in this case would be 120 minus 0.02 times the quantity we found here, which was 1500. I don't remember what that turns out to be, but we can look at the solution to find it. Ninety. So the optimal price is ninety. That's one answer. That's another answer. And the typical third answer here is to evaluate the optimal profit. How much will the monopolist sit back with after making his price and quantity decision. And as it says here, finally optimal profits, let me take it up a little bit here. Uh, the, and then I use M here to denote that this is a monopolist. I tend to use that. Okay, so if it's PM, it's the price of the monopolist. If it's PPC, it's the price of a perfectly competitive situation and so on. Okay, so these indexes kind of denotes what situation we look at. We can find then, of course, 
the consequence for the profit by just putting the optimal quantity into this one if we like or alternatively do as I do it here and go one step back and note that revenue now is the optimal price times the optimal quantity 90 times 1500 then we just subtract the cost which this corresponds to so instead of using this expression as I could do I just use the revenue expression directly, or price times quantity. The price is 90, quantity is 1500, and then we just subtract the cost, which we find by putting the optimal quantity of 1500 into the cost function. That results or leads to a profit level of 20,000 for the monopolist in this case. Okay, maybe I went too far fast away here. But this is straightforward, okay? It should impose no real difficulties. What could be expected on the exam here would be something like this, but instead of, uh, I would probably reformulate it. Instead of a firm, I would, could say an event uh, arranger or something, wants to stage a concert. Uh, these event arrangers, arranger, he faces a certain demand curve among his audience. Of course, if I want to make it more tricky, I can say there are two types of, 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 of audience here. Either they like that kind of music or the other one. There's a lot of possibilities here to make it more complex. <coughs> Of course, you'll have to assume then that this event arranger is a monopolist in this market. And you can use this method to, to find the price of the tickets, for instance. Okay. And how many tickets you would sell. But as we know, there is not an infinite number of audience around, is it? Especially not in Molde. There's only 25,000 people here. So unless we're able to import everybody from elsewhere, it's kind of limited. Okay, so Maybe this monopoly model won't work as it should. Okay, now in B, if the government decides to levy a tax, I don't know this term levy. What does it mean, Eric? Put on? Yeah, yeah. put on a tax of 14 cents per unit on this product. What will be the new level of production, price, and profit? Okay, now again, let's go back to the lectures here. We discussed this in the lecture, didn't we? There was a figure here. Of course, then you need to know the content of that figure. And it turns out that this exercise fits this figure perfectly, doesn't it? Because we have a constant marginal cost here. And you add the cost, you just raise the marginal cost to find a new solution. <laughs> and the, the, the argument we're going to put into this was perhaps that if we put a tax into this situation, tax eight, the monopolist, of this size, this is kind of the amount which kind of goes back to the guy who puts the tax on, the price change is bigger than the tax. Okay, so it kind of produces an extra price tag, so to speak. So even though if the government put a tax on, let's say, petrol of one krone, you should expect that the petrol will turn out to be more expensive than one krone more. Okay, that's the idea here. That is something that you, you can draw out of this. In uh, this case, um, let's see if we do it like this. It says here, a tax of 14 cents leads to an increase in marginal costs by 14. Then we find marginal revenue equal to marginal cost in order to resolve the problem, so to speak. I assume that it's a tax on the producer's hand here. If the consumer has to pay the tax, the solution is different and observable on page 725 in the textbook. Okay, so this is kind of a matter of taste. The exercise is perhaps not precise enough here on who kind of bears the tax. But given this, which corresponds to the 
the primary figure we looked at in the ex in the in the lecture uh, we just form marginal revenue equal to marginal cost but of course in this case the marginal cost is increasing due to the fact that this 14 or whatever is put on as a tax and then we get uh, and you see i have calculated the marginal revenue here haven't i the marginal revenue can be found by taking this expression no sorry 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 uh, 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 uh. here is the revenue function isn't it so to find the marginal revenue you have to take the derivative of this one so then this is the revenue function as a function of q and the marginal revenue again as a function of q would be 120 minus 2 times 0 0.02 q 2 times 0 0.02 is again 0 0.04 so we end up with this expression don't we this is the marginal revenue curve and it should equate the, the original marginal cost which was 60 and we have to add 14 so it's 74 here and we just do some simple calculations here to find and then I use QM T star, T means tax, which is the amount put into the market given that this tax is put on top of it. And it turns out to be 1150. This was kind of what we should expect, wasn't it? Due to the graph we saw that the quantity went down. Okay, it went from started at 1500, went down to 1150. Let me just finish this and then we will take a break. Of course, uh, we are asked to do the same uh, thing here. It turns out that the, the price then can be found similarly as we did previously by just entering it into the demand curve. And now we put in 1150 instead of 1500 as we did on top there. And the price increases from 90 to 97. So in this case, we didn't see the effect that we see it so in the figure, didn't we? Because in the figure, the tax was smaller than the price change. Here's the other way around, isn't it? Because the, the, the tax is 14, while the price only increases from 90 to 97. So it's not given that it happens. It depends on the numbers. And of course, the optimal profit is uh, calculated in the same way as previously. just by entering price times quantity minus total cost. And of course, the, the fixed cost part here is, uh, or the, you, you see the cost function here, what was it, did it, let me take that, okay. We had a cost function here, it looked like what? Uh, hmm, hmm. It was 60Q, wasn't it? plus 25,000, if I'm not completely out of memory here. Okay. Now in this case, we have to change this cost function in order to find the optimal profit in the tax case. And then we need to know what to do with this 14, don't we? Because this 14 is adding to the marginal cost. Of course, the marginal cost here is the derivative of this one. Okay, so it's 60. It means to, to get a new marginal cost of 74, we have to add 14 to this one, okay? So the, the new cost function must be 74Q plus 25,000, okay? 60 plus 14. Then the derivative is 74, which is kind of explicitly added here, or in this case it's the, the actual cost coefficient, so to speak, so it's 74 times 1150, and then we add 25,000 in the end, and then we calculate the new profit to be 1450. So you see, in this case, the monopolist is not happy about the profit, uh, sorry, about the tax, because his profits are going down, aren't they? Is this correctly calculated? Is it so much smaller? From 20,000 down to 1450. Okay. Did you get this number? Any of you? Nobody? 
Was this a difficult exercise? Hey, did you have even try? You did try. Okay. I just I got curious whether it's kind of price is ninety seven. That's correct. The cost turns out to be sixty plus fourteen. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of a big change from twenty thousand down to fourteen fifty. That was kind of my reaction. Okay. But of course it's possible. We can always taxate the monopolist in such a way that he gets zero in profits. Okay. That's that's possible. I know no means. Maybe I can give you that on the exam. How much do you need to taxate the monopolist to get zero in profits? That's the idea, isn't it? You don't want these schools or railways or whatever to earn money on behalf of the society. Okay. Then it's time for a break. Unless we have any questions. I have the feeling that some of you have some problems with this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you have to tell me what the problems you have, okay? What didn't you understand here? I can't help you unless I don't know what you don't understand. Okay, let's have a break and think about it, okay? You want to say something? In Norwegian? In Norwegian, okay. Just a moment, okay?